Welcome to St. Mary's Church of Blessed Michael McGivney Parish. Today we celebrate the, tw- the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Our second collection this weekend is the Catholic Campaign for Human Development Collection. Your generosity in this special appeal is deeply appreciated. The celebrant for our Mass this morning is Father Joe, and the special intention for this Mass is for Louise Byrne. Today's readings can be found in the Red Worship Hymnal, number six, number 966. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My brothers and sisters, let us call to mind our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, and what I have failed to do, through my faults, through my faults, through my most grievous faults, 
Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Grant us, we pray, O Lord our God, the constant gladness of being devoted to you, for it is full and lasting happiness to serve with constancy the author of all that is good. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of Proverbs. When one finds a worthy wife, her value is far beyond pearls. Her husband, entrusting his heart to her, has an unfailing prize. She brings him good and not evil all the days of her life. She obtains wool and flax and works with loving hands. She puts her hands to the distaff and her fingers to ply the spindle. She reaches out her hands to the poor and extends her arms to the needy. Charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting. The woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a reward for her labors and let her works praise her at the city gates. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Concerning times and seasons, brothers and sisters, we have no need for anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief at night. When people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster comes upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness for that day to overtake you like a thief. For all of you are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Please God be in my mind and on my lips and in my heart. Jesus told his disciples this parable. A man going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received the two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward and said, 
Master, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear, I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is back. His master said to him in reply, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter. Should you not then have put my money in the bank so that I could have it got it back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has, done, even what he has will be taken away. And throw this useless servant into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. If you were to paint a portrait of the Lord God Almighty, what would it look like? I'll put that question in a different way because I imagine many of us are not the most able of artists, myself included, so here's another way of asking that question for us this morning. When you go into your inner room to have that heart-to-heart, one-on-one conversation with the Lord God, Who is it that looks back at you? What does he look like? How does God appear to you? I'll jump to conclusions a bit and hazard a wager that many of us would have a very similar response to that question. Many of us from various walks of life, backgrounds, and professions would have a similar portrait, I think, of what God looks like to us. For many of us, That portrait of God is perhaps something akin to that great, angry old man up in the clouds of fable who looks down upon us with a stern and vindictive gaze, peering over our shoulders at every little thing we do. He's something akin to the heavenly accountant that keeps up a long ledger of all our many faults and foibles and is waiting for that appointed moment when he, with kind of a wry smile, will smite us with his hellfire for each and every toe that has been out of place. Yes, I think, let's face it, I think many of us, at least in part, our image, our vision of God shares something of this. We have this image of God as sort of a stern and exacting parent figure against whom we foster in our hearts a kind of servile fear of the punishments that are in store for any transgressions we might commit. That certainly seems to be, in a certain sense, the image of God presented by these difficult readings for this 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. For those of us who have been reading attentively through the first reading, the second reading, the Gospel, what portrait is painted of God We see that the Lord God will come to us very soon. The second reading tells us the days are short before the coming of the Lord. And how will he come, we are told? Well, he will come seated upon the clouds with the sound of a trumpet and the voice of command to bring an end to all things and to sit in judgment over our lives, over each and every one of our doings. And as we hear in the gospel quite clearly, he'll have that ledger book there ready to see not only if we have maintained what has been entrusted to us of our time, talent, and treasure, but also whether or not we have made something more of it, whether or not we have made interest. And if we have not, then what will await us but the outer darkness where there shall be wailing and grinding of teeth? That's the image that appears to be presented to us today of who God is. Again, this this stern 
exacting parent figure. Well, I'm here to assure you this morning that this kind of vision, image, portrait of God is in fact a forgery, a fraud, a falsity that does not respond to the reality of who God actually is for each one of us. I think if we listen attentively to this parable, we find that who God truly is, that portrait that painted for us, is entirely different. So let's take a moment to enter in once more to this parable, this famous parable, of these three servants who are entrusted with talents from their master. I want you to take a moment to enter into the shoes of those three servants who come before their master and are entrusted with these various talents. Think about what it would be like to be a servant back in the ancient Near East so many centuries ago. For your whole life, you have done nothing more than serve menial tasks for your master. You have nothing really to claim for your own. You have no money or possessions, really. You have no prospect of any kind of future in your profession. You really have no standing in society whatsoever. You are nothing more than a servant. And on top of that, you are set under a master who is exorbitantly wealthy, of great means. We are told in the parable today the master is disposed of at least eight talents. What was a talent in the ancient world? It's not a proclivity or penchant for a certain activity as we understand it today. A talent in the ancient world was a unit of measurement. In fact, it was the greatest unit of measurement of precious metals like silver or gold. Think of great big giant ingots of silver kept somewhere in Fort Knox, something like that. Scholars tell us that talents at the time of the New Testament would have been somewhere around 60 pounds of precious metal. So a silver ingot would probably have been worth something like 15 years worth of daily wages. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And this master has eight of those talents at least. So here you are, this servant serving these menial tasks, and your master is wildly wealthy. And one day, he calls you and two other servants into his office and says to you, I'm going on a, a great journey far away, somewhere across the sea, let's say to Corinth or to Ephesus, somewhere like that. And I can't bring my wealth along with me. This is, of course, before the days of having a digital bank account or cryptocurrency. Your wealth was tied to what you could hold. And certainly he couldn't bring around with him eight 60-pound talents of silver and gold. So you might imagine, okay, maybe he's going to find the most remote cave in the world to put away those talents, to hire the best guards to protect those talents. Maybe he will bury them away somewhere. No, he doesn't do that. Maybe he's going to find the most safe bank you could find in the world with the most impenetrable safe and put the talents away there where no one can get to them. No, he doesn't do that. What does he do as he calls you and these two other servants into the office? This wealthy man, he entrusts those talents to you, to his servants, not to brokers or bankers or accountants, not to a security force or a police force. No, he entrusts his great wealth with lavish generosity to you, his servants, who know nothing of safeguarding or accounting, who simply are menial laborers. He entrusts his wealth to you. And why does he do this? Simply out of trust, out of love. He says to you, yes, you are my servants, but you have always been members of my household, of my family. And so I entrust what I have to you. Imagine how amazing this moment would have been for those servants, how unexpected. Maybe the first time in their lives that they're noticed in a major way and they're given such great responsibility. All of a sudden, these servants now have millions of dollars in their possession and their master is off away in a far and distant land. What would be the, the reasonable, rational response to such a great gift as that? I would suggest it would be what the first two servants do. My master has been so lavishly generous to me, has entrusted this to me. 
He could have certainly gone and buried his wealth away or put it in a bank somewhere, but he has entrusted it to me for a reason. So what is the rational and reasonable response? I will foster this great wealth given to me to the best of my ability so that I can make even more in gratitude for that great gift of my master. That, I think, is the reasonable response of the first two servants. What, on the other hand, is the irrational, unreasonable response given by the third servant? Maybe to run down to Tweed Airport and get the first direct ticket to San Juan or to Miami Beach? That would be probably my unrational response. No, the, the unrational, sorry, irrational, unreasonable response of this third servant is to do what? To turn back against the hand of the one who has given so generously to him, to begin to conjure up in his mind's eye a false image of who his master is, and then to fester within his heart fear of the punishments that would be in store for any transgressions. We see in the gospel, what does the third servant do? He begins to form this false image of who his master is. He says, he's someone who reaps where he did not sow. He's basically claiming he's a thief, his master. Even though this third servant had no evidence to support that claim, the only thing that had been showed to him was lavish and generous mercy and a wonderful gift. And he immediately turns back and starts to create this false image. And what is then festering, festering in his heart, this fear. And out of fear, what does he do? He does the very thing that that master could have done on his own. He takes the wealth that's given to him, millions of dollars worth, and he buries it in the ground and does not nothing more with it. Think of how great an offense this would have been to the master. After he had shown such great generosity, after he had entrusted him with this great gift, out of fear, he does nothing more. And even more so, begins to apply a false image of who the master is. And so, he really does condemn himself. All because he's under the sway of a false vision of who his master is. My brothers and sisters in Christ, who is that master for us? It's the Lord God who has bestowed upon each one of us an amazing gift. He who is disposed of every gift, every rich thing in the world, every blessing. He who has no need of us, we are, by comparison, just these menial laborers. He has given to us of his very life, which is to say his grace, his divine life, in an exorbitant fashion. The greatest gift we could ever imagine has been given to us in baptism, is renewed for us each time we celebrate the sacraments. We receive the fullness of the gifts and the graces of the Holy Spirit that we need for our vocation and life at confirmation. We have received the greatest of all gifts, which the Lord God may have simply buried away in himself, or he may have simply given it to those who would seem more worthy. But no, he has given it to such as us, as unqualified, as sinful as we may be. We are the servants that have been entrusted with this great wealth. And so what is the rational and reasonable response to that great gift? Well, of course, to do everything we can to allow that divine life to be fostered, to grow, to be nurtured, to spread it to all those whom we meet. What would be the unreasonable and irrational response? To start to turn against the one who has given us such great gifts. To think of him in a false and fraudulent way as one who wants nothing more than to see our downfall. To begin to foster in our hearts fear, a servile fear of him who has given us so many great gifts. If we do such as this, then we will be, like that third servant, worthy of nothing more than to be put out into the outer darkness where there is wailing and grinding of teeth, as the Lord says in the gospel today. No. Our mission this day is to have that true sense of gratitude for that great gift given to us and to do all that we can to allow that divine life to be nurtured, spread to all that we meet. So we pray this day for that great grace from the Lord that he who is revealed to us in the breaking of the bread today might help us to truly do that in the days ahead, especially as we 
prepare to celebrate this great feast of Thanksgiving, a time to be truly thankful for these many blessings, these talents that we have received, and to do what we can to respond in kind. So I invite you, as you go forth from here today, to turn to the Lord in prayer, to paint a picture in your mind of who that Lord God is, and to give him thanks for all his many blessings. We now stand to profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. God from God, life from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things are made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the Holy Spirit, was incarnate by the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life, the life of the world to come. To come. Amen. Amen. In a spirit of thanksgiving, we turn to our almighty God and ask him to hear and answer each and every one of our petitions and needs. And so we pray for the Holy Church of God throughout the world. May she continue to announce courageously the gospel of salvation and to witness joyfully to Christ crucified and risen. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for those called to govern nations May they commit themselves to seeking the common good in true freedom and peace, so that humanity's hope for dignity, justice, and life may be realized. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our nation, as we prepare to celebrate Thanksgiving Day, may the Lord God strengthen us with the gifts and graces that will allow us to continue to stand for all the world as a shining city set on a hill. <clears throat> for this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are treated unjustly and without compassion, may all conflict and aggression <clears throat> give way to swift and peaceful resolution. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who live in poverty, for those sick in body and spirit, for the marginalized, the elderly, those who live in lonely circumstances, may their cry of suffering be met with our fraternal concern and assistance. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for our community of faith here in the city of New Haven, may the Lord inspire us all to be faithful stewards of the many gifts and talents he has entrusted to us. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died, in the hope of eternal life. And in a special way at this Eucharist, we pray for Louise Byrne. For them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. And now in the silence of our hearts, let each of us make known our own needs to a tender and loving God. And for these intentions, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, we ask that you would this day hear and answer all these needs and petitions and those kept in the silence of our hearts, if they be in accord with your most holy will. We ask this in all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. of the time. 
brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that what we offer in the sight of your majesty may obtain for us the grace of being devoted to you and gain us the prize of everlasting happiness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Give them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care,
but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels and saints, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, Leonard, our Bishop, Christopher, our coadjutor Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, as Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come. 
Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them. As once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, holy sacrifice, the spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, which John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer to one another a sign of Christ's peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord. Lord. 
let us pray. We have partaken of the gifts of this sacred mystery, humbly imploring, O Lord, that what your Son commanded us to do in memory of him may bring us growth in charity through Christ our Lord. All of you are warmly welcome to join us for our weekly hospitality after Mass today. You can access the church hall for that hospitality and food and treats and coffee by exiting the church over on this side and coming into the basement of the church. We hope to see you all there. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace, glorifying the Lord by our lives. Thanks be to God. We pray our prayer for vocations to the priesthood. Heavenly Father, you have created us for a definite purpose. Grant us the grace to know the path you have planned for each of us in this life and to respond with a generous yes. Make my parish, my home, and my heart fruitful ground for your gift of vocations to the priesthood of Jesus Christ. May our young men respond to your call with courage and zeal. Stir among them the desire and the strength to be good and holy priests. We make our prayer for priestly vocations to you, Father, in the Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. St. Joseph, patron of our archdiocese, pray for us. Blessed Michael McGivney, and our prayer for the canonization of Blessed Michael McGivney. God, our Father, protector of the poor and defender of the widow and orphan, you called your priest, Blessed Michael McGivney, to be an apostle of Christian family life and to lead the young to the generous service of their neighbor. Through the example of his life and virtue, may we follow your Son, Jesus Christ, more closely, fulfilling his commandments of charity and building up his body, which is the Church. Let the inspiration of your servant prompt us to greater confidence in your love so that we may continue his work of caring for the needy and the outcasts. We humbly ask that you glorify, bless and like and give me on earth according to the design of your holy will. Through his intercession, grant the favor I now present. Through Christ our Lord. Please join us in singing our final hymn, number 535, God We Praise You, number 535. 